Hey, if you've heard of a quick and dirty tree, we're going to talk about that, but we're, I'm kind of putting a twist on it, and I'm calling it a quick and dirty branch, so that you can help focus your uh, research and kind of use through lines in a quick and dirty way. All right, we're going to get to that here in just a moment, but first, if this is your first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family history research. Now, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. And well, there's a newsletter and Facebook page and all that stuff. Links for all of that are in the show notes below. Let's jump into it. So we're gonna talk about a quick and dirty branch. So if you have heard of a quick and dirty tree before, well, let me explain what a quick and dirty tree is if this is new to you. So what a quick and dirty tree is, is, is uh, as, Dr. Blaine Bettinger said, it is an unverified tree built quickly for a match to a potentially known or suspected names and or locations in common. So the idea behind a quick and dirty tree is really to create a quick tree, unverified, no records attached, just importing it from other members, and then, uh, adding it to your private unsearchable tree. So let's talk a little bit more about that for a minute. So why use a quick and dirty tree? Well, it typically is used to help us understand the relationships between cousins and help us build that out quickly. It's a lot of times it's used for descendancy research. It's used for adoption research. It's used for all kinds of stuff. But then what we do, once we kind of build out that quick and dirty tree privately so that nobody else copies from it, um, then what we do is we go back and verify the line, right? So that way that if the tree is uh, inaccurate, we'll catch it before it goes public, okay? So uh, I am kind of doing a spinoff of that. I am creating this quick and dirty branch. And the idea is that using this method, it's the same method as the quick and dirty tree, but it also justifies... Uh, the linkage between generations using one quality record so that you're still working quickly, but you can use it in your regular tree that could be public if it is public, and it can utilize the DNA cousin matches, especially the through line. So the idea here is that we semi-justify, we semi-prove the, the line. Okay, so this quick and dirty uh, branch uses one quality record to temporarily justify the connections. Okay, so the one records, the one record that I'm recommending could be a census record, a vital record, newspaper obituaries, firsthand written genealogies or stories, that's usually from the source, right? Church records, Bible records, wills, probate, estates, uh, land records, uh, the military records, court records, any official record. So this is the one record that you could use to help justify the link quickly. Okay. There's more to this. What I'm saying is caution, verify, verify, verify. So once you've kind of figured out what you think is the correct line, you're going to go back and do this again. And so that way you could be like, researching several lines in order to try maybe you're doing descendancy research and you're trying to find other dna cousins and or whatever the reason and once you think you have the line that you are trying to satisfy your research question about then you go back and you do reasonably exhaustive research and you verify that line okay it's really important that you do this because you don't want to be putting information out there that could be incorrect okay at least you're going to have one record attached to everybody that says, this is the parent of this child, okay? And a lot of times you can do this in census records pretty easily. Um, you can do this in Bible records pretty easily, any of the church records, but in even the obituaries, okay? Then, you know, when you're going back to do your reasonably exhaustive research, you know, that's part of the genealogical proof standards. It's also known as the GPS, but the very first, first rule of the GPS is reasonably exhaustive research. Basically, that means turning over every rock to find all the records, and then you can further verify or disprove uh, the linkage. So it could be that the one record you pulled was wrong. So if you go and back and you, you, you do all of the research and you find all of those records, then you might find that, hey, you know, I was wrong. 
that one record was wrong. All of these other records tell me a different story. That's kind of the, the quick view. We're going to go jump over to the uh, computer now and put that into practice. Okay, so here we are over at my tree, and I'm going to be working on this part of the family tree, but one of the reasons why I want to do this, I kind of want to explain here. So I'm really kind of working on this part of the tree, but I'm really wanting to learn all the descendants of this Jesse Davis, okay? Now in this view, you're looking at the ancestral view. If I flip this over to the descendants view, it just gets too crazy busy for you to see because um, old Jesse Davis here had 13 children. And as you can see down here, he's got a lot of kids. So I'm banking on the fact that the kids, one of which is my three times great grandfather, these children, all of the children of this couple probably have more records that I want to grab a hold of. But in, in order for me to really get a handle on this line too, I have, you know, taken a DNA test. And so I want to be able to find all the descendants from uh, Jesse, Elizabeth, and Joel in the DNA because they probably have built out the tree. And that way I can really focus and verify my DNA connections as well. So knowing that Jesse Jesse has 13 children, that means there's going to be a ton of descendants. So as I'm working through that, I am working over there in through lines, okay? And this whole quick and dirty branch thing uses through lines to quickly build out the descendancy tree. So I'm going to filter this down to my father's side and I'm going to scroll down and here's Jesse. This is the same Jesse that you see right here. Here's Jesse. So when I click through to that, I, here's what I get. This is my fourth time great grandfather. Here's Joel Davis, my third time great grandfather. And here's Joel Davis, my junior, basically my second time great grandfather. And I have already collected all of the DNA cousins and the descendants from this line. Now what I'm going to do is Joel Davis Jr. I want to collect from all of the siblings. So I'm going to jump over here to Jesse Davis and start working on the descendants here using the DNA cousins because they've done a lot of the research already. Now keep in mind this does not mean that these are all the kids just because there's DNA matches. Now there might be some lines that don't have any DNA connections or descendants who have tested. So just be mindful of that. Okay, so remember we're trying to import descendants quickly using one record. Now I've already done it for this, for the descendants of Isaac. Now we're gonna do it for the descendants of Rebecca Jane. So I'm gonna open this up. We can see that William Davis has the dashed lines and so we haven't imported that. So we're looking for a relationship between Rebecca and William Davis. So William Davis is born in 1878. He, therefore, he should be in an 1880 census record. So if I click on this, it pops out this side screen and it shows me all the member trees that have William Davis in their trees. And the top one uh, usually has the most records. In fact, there's several records here that both have 15, 15, 15, 14, 11. And so usually the top ones have uh, the most records. So what I want to do is I want to click on one of these top trees and I want to drill right into the records because I'm looking for that one quality record for verification. Now remember he's born in 1878 so he should be two, you know, one to two years old in 1880. So let's go look. In 1880 we find William H. Davis at two years old uh, and here's Rebecca Davis and John Davis. And so we could, we can't really save it to our tree yet because he's not in our tree yet. So what we want to do is we can go back over to through lines and we can say add to tree. Now the only thing that I have hesitancy about this is that her name is Davis here. There's a Davis here. So I don't know what's going on as far as her marrying a Davis when she was already a Davis. Not quite sure how um, that would work, but I'm going to go ahead and import him anyway because I do have evidence showing that Rebecca Davis here is the wife of John Davis. I'm going to add to the tree. Remember, we're going to go back and verify this later. And now what we could do is we could view in profile straight here. Now he's got the solid line, but what I want to do is I'm going to jump over here and now I'm going to hit save to someone in my tree and I'm going to say William Davis and he was born in 1878. Here he is right here and I'm going to say attach and I could go through that process. I'm just going to say save to your tree. 
and then I'm going to close that tab. And now he's got the solid line. And now I'm going to import Donald. So now I'm looking for a relationship between Donald and William. Okay, now he was born in 1923, so he should be in the 1930 census. I'm just looking for some reasonable explanation. Uh, relationship records right here, or I could drill into them from here. I'm actually going to drill in from here and see what these people are saying. Look at the records. 1930. Donald is six years old. Is that right? Born in 1923. He should be, yeah, within a year. That's, that's good. He probably hasn't had his birthday yet. And so uh, there's William H. Davis and son Donald Davis. So I'm going to say yes to that. So I can't save it to my tree yet because Donald's not in the tree yet. So I come back over here and I say add to my tree. And now Donald is added into my tree. And now I can come back over here and say save to someone in my tree. I can say Donald Davis, and there he is in 1923, say attach and save to my tree. And now we've added these two guys. Now we could go on to Henry I. Davis and Cora Ethel Davis, daughter of Henry. So in 1891 is when she was born, so she should be in the 1900 census. We look for records for the 1900 census. Records, 1900. There she is at nine years old and her father, Henry. Okay, that works for me. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna say add to tree. And now she's added to the tree. I'm gonna go back over to this other tab and and I'm gonna save to my tree, save to someone. So I'm justifying, right? I'm justifying by adding her to this tree with this record, I'm justifying how I imported that. Now she's in the tree, I don't need that anymore. And now we're gonna go on to Edward. Edward Smith. So more than likely Cora married somebody by the name of Smith. And so we are probably gonna be looking for, and this says 1920, he may not have been born yet. So he's either gonna be in the 1920 census as an infant, or he's gonna be in the 1930 census as a nine or 10 year old, okay? So Cora probably married a Smith and then Edward's gonna be a son. So let's go look at the records. So we're gonna click on Edward. This says the 1930 census up here. And this shows us, I wanna view this record. Let's look at this record. All right, so there is Cora married to a guy named Smith and Edward is the son at nine years old. So that works. So now we come back over here and we say add to tree. And now he's in the tree. We come back over to the census record and we're gonna say save to someone in my tree. And this was Edward, Edward Smith. There he is, brand new in our tree. We hit save and save to our tree. And we're done with this tab, we close that out. So now we have added all four of these people relatively quickly. The only one that gives me really pause is these two. I wanna go back and verify those later. But now I've been able to add those guys into my tree. And I'm still not feeling really good about these two. I probably uh, will go back and do a, a lot of investigation about this connection right here because it, it just, something doesn't feel right about it. And so it might be that I just disconnect uh, this guy from her in the tree. And we've talked about that in other episodes, how to uh, uh, unlink a relationship. What I wanna talk about next is why we do this because if any of you have seen my previous episode, I was trying to prove that this Joel Davis Jr. out of five men was the correct two times great grandfather to me. This guy was born out of wedlock. She had relationships with uh, one of the Davis men. We had proven that through Y-DNA. And so my point is I needed to go up a generation or two and do all of the descendancy research to find out which DNA cousins closest match to any of the five brothers. And it turns out to be Joel Davis. Let me show you what I did. Jumping over to my Excel spreadsheet, I did all of that descendancy research that I showed you a few minutes ago, mapping out every DNA cousin I could find. Now, I know you can't read this, but all you need to really read are the colors. Okay, so here I am in this little yellow box, okay? All of those siblings that I was showing you a minute ago in the through lines are up here. Now, these are all of the siblings, regardless of whether there was DNA matches or not. In some cases, here's some, here's some of the descendants that have no DNA matches, okay? So for the simplicity sake, I then did some conditional formatting. What I did was I went and I took all the DNA cousins, I removed their names, and I just put the number of, and I'll show you this closer here in a second, but I just put the number of centimorgans in the boxes of all of these colored boxes. I'm in the yellow, so that doesn't matter. And then all of these boxes that have numbers in them, 
are representative of Cinemorgans. Then what I did was I went and I created a conditional format showing basically using color scales, right? You can change the color scales. However, I want to set the color scales. I created color scales showing me basically the hot zones. Okay. And that's what these are here. Okay. Then I also added the scale on here. I will show you this more in a minute, but you can see some of the bars on here inside the cells that are representing the greater number of centimorgans. So as you can see at a broad view of all of my DNA cousins from all of the, dis all of these children of Joel Davis senior, including Joel Davis Jr., who I ultimately descend from, as opposed to these other siblings over here, as you can see, the blue colors are a little bit colder. It's kind of like, you know, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, you're getting warmer, right? All of these DNA cousins, with the exception of this one, I'll explain that in a minute, these are the hottest, closest, DNA cousins I have. Now you got to keep in mind, these are generational differences. Okay. So the farther we go down in generation, you can kind of half again, the Cinemorgans, right? This really hot one here is my first cousin, the male who took the Y DNA test. We both descend from the same great grandfather, but we were trying to solve for one of the men in this line. So I had to go and I had to go up a generation or two and and look for all of the family tree and the descendants from all of the people who had tested. And so all of these colored boxes, with the exception of this one and this one, all of those represent the DNA cousins, okay? And as you can see, there are four here, really kind of five, I actually think she is a half relationship. So these four are key to solving the fact that these boxes here have a greater number of centimorgans collectively even, and they descend through this Lorena Edith Davis, who comes from Joel Davis, okay? So I am cl most closely related to these. Now I went and did additional research to make sure that there was no pedigree collapse, meaning cousins marrying cousins somewhere up the line, and I didn't find any. So this kind of seals the deal for the most part, unless other evidence comes to light, it is my belief that I descend from Joel Davis Jr. And again, Joel Davis Jr. is, this is Joel Davis Sr., here's Joel Davis Jr. It's his siblings that you saw in, in that list, in this list. This is Joel Davis Jr. And it's uh, all of his siblings up here and then his children. And it is through this, this connection here and this connection here that I most closely relate. So that has kind of solved my problem for now. I am 95% confident that Joel Davis Jr. is my two times great grandfather. Now, should more DNA evidence come to light later that is much stronger, then I may have to rethink this. But this is why we do the descendancy research and why we create a quick and dirty branch. Well, that's how I solved my genealogical research problem using uh, descendancy research in combination with uh, the DNA research, researching all of those DNA cousins and figuring out how they related to the family. And then as you could see, I had kind of a hot zone as to some family members that were the closest matches to me. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's absolute. There could be more evidence that comes to light later, but that's kind of what I have right now. So uh, don't forget that uh, for those of you who are channel members, there's a handout with a step-by-step -step process of how I did this, if that is in, of interest to you. And you can join the channel membership at the information access level to get all the handouts and all the previous handouts by scrolling through the blog posts on the community tab. All right, well, I hope that was helpful. There are more uh, videos on the screen for you now. And well, until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.